So, but let's jump into reproducible research and why we want to do that. And there's a nice PhD comic um, about this where Professor Smith um, has his PhD student in front of him and asks, well, that's it. well, don't, don't worry, you don't have to start your code from scratch. You can reuse the software that the previous person on the project wrote uh, several years ago. And uh, are there instructions for how to use it? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, is the code commented? Um, not likely. Uh, and where are the files? Uh, who knows? This is going to be painful, isn't it? Uh, just a scratch. And um, I think this is, at least to some extent, uh, very much what a lot of people in academia have experienced. I myself had a similar thing where I was told, here, here is code that we want to have in our library. Please um, connect it to the library that we have. And there wasn't mm. a lot of documentation. And that was essentially my bachelor thesis in the end. Um, so this happens all the time, unfortunately. And there's, um, and while that's bad, there's also the problem that, well, that's here in this anecdote where a group of researchers have obtained great results and submitted their work uh, to a high profile journal. The reviewers ask for a few more figures and some additional analysis, which is actually quite common. The researchers start working on those revisions, uh, generate modified figures, uh, but find inconsistencies with their old figures. And then the problems start because the researchers can't find some of the data they used to generate the original results and they can't figure out which parameters they used when running their original analysis. And well, that manuscript is likely to just end up in a drawer and never really be published because you they don't know what they actually did. Yeah, this uh, this actually the anecdote highlights the most to me the most important aspect of the reproducibility and uh, things we want to do for reproducibility, which is that you should you should make your own life easier yeah that you can reproduce your own own results and the this this graph also highlights that problem yeah that it's and at least to me it's somewhat understandable if there are some issues with reproducibility um, in experimental fields where there are so many confounding factors um, uh, where there have been examples where a changed water pipe changed the results because there was something coming from the water pipe that wasn't um, expected and they didn't test for and that changed the results. But in a computational setting, this should not happen mm. because we can a lot better control what we are doing and this should be a lot more reproducible and anything in a computational field that's not reproducible comes essentially down to badly documented steps for the experiment hmm. and there are different levels of by the, by the way can we highlight that in the graph the 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 question question that i i have failed to I have failed to reproduce an experiment and my own. Yeah. And it's it's like... Uh, there there isn't a big there, difference between your own and the, uh, it's someone yeah, else's. Yeah, That's, there isn't a big yeah. difference and the there is a huge amount of percentage like in both cases. Yeah. So, yeah. And this was 2016, but the, basically in eight years, I don't think anything has fundamentally changed one, one would hope that this go has gone down a little bit but yeah i would also expect that it hasn't gone down substantially hmm. and essentially um as i mentioned earlier uh so you have different levels of reproducibility and you have uh, a kind of pyramid on how you're um what can be a reproduce and of course the environment in especially experimental um uh, settings can be something that is v potentially very difficult to control. But we can control it reasonably well in a computational setting. 
and in a computational setting it's also we have code and data and that should be controllable because the data has been it, it's there it has been generated so and it, and it shouldn't change and the code also has been there and shouldn't change then it comes to how has the code been used that's documentation what parameters have been used that's documentation and only in the end once we have all this we create we build an article and if if something below here fails then this article fails because it can't be reproduced because if we don't know what parameters we had well nice to have the code but how did the results actually get obtained we don't know so the whole basis of this article crumbles essentially and we have asked you uh, in the collaborative document to post a few of your um, experiences uh, with um, with re reprodu reproducibility of the things and I, I actually want to highlight this first one that was in here because uh, this is something that happens both to the person writing it and to uh, and to others coming there where you, you, you have stuff and you, you try to read it and think well yeah it has been done but i don't get anything here hmm. because it's not well documented or it's not well written and you essentially have to redo things and that's something that's very very common hmm. um the here this is also um the typical yeah um a new version of the package has been um has been published and the old version doesn't work on the current system anymore or you have to go to great length to uh, go through this which is a really huge issue um uh i i can i can relate to this all these uh all of these answers and one thing i actually want to point out is that in the question it says that a uh, script or a figure you created a few months ago for me i don't have to wait a few months because like a day or two is completely enough because like i i if i don't document stuff for myself in two days it's basically I, I I may have to start over. So I I complete, completely know what people are coming from with these comments. Yeah. So I think all of these are really good examples of why we need reproducible research. And I hope we can show you a couple of uh, things that help you in making your reproducibility or making your work more reproducible either by others or yourself okay and so uh so just an overview of the of the two hours next two hours so we have four subtopics here so first is organizing your projects so files and folders structure basically mm -hmm. uh, the next is uh recording computational steps so what was run and when and where, how and how then recording dependencies which is that what like. is the what is the software or what libraries and which versions of software and libraries your code is using to get the results and then recording environments which is uh what operating system, what system libraries? Um, so essentially going one step further down but, the environment chain. Yeah. Da, da, <laughs> one step further down the rabbit hole of reproducibility. Yeah. OK, yeah, sorry. Okay. Go, go ahead. So let's... let's get into organizing your projects. Um, so yeah, it's really one of the first steps is um, to make your work reproducible is to, to organize your projects well. So to know to have a structure that you um that you understand that you where you can actually find things again. Because even the finding the right function, finding the right piece of data um can become difficult if your 
data and your project is not properly organized. So first of all, of course, um, have your have everything that belongs to a project in a single folder, because then you have something where you can have it uh, or where you know, okay, this is what it is. And if that's not possible because you have, for example, um, some big data that needs to be stored elsewhere, have links or indicators where that data can be found early on. That can be in a readme or in some other uh, or in some other way how this um, can be stored. Um, use different projects in different folders. Don't mix. Um, it, it will only lead to a mess and you can't get out of that mess again because um, untangling mixed up uh, projects will always be a problem. If you have things like um, code that you use in both, both projects, set up a Git repository for the code and clone it into both projects. Um, and potentially have a branch for each project if they, if they really do have different um, co uh, code in the end, but try to get the code uh, in the way that um, both can use it. Um, use a consistent and informative directory structure. Uh, this, for example, uh, this is an example of what you can do. Have data, process data. So data is, is the raw information. This is what, what you got from your experiments or what you got from an external partner or, uh, yeah, or a partner. This is the raw data. Process data is anything that you have uh, pre-processed or modified. The manuscript um, is everything that's connected with the with writing um, the article in the end or the the articles if you have multiple for the same project. Um, results is um, essentially finished data, some tables, uh, figures, and everything that you want to put into the manuscript potentially. Source is your code um, with a license, with requirements and information about it. And doc is the additional documentation. Your readme can already contain some of the docs or contain information on, okay, um, this is where you find the documentation for this. Um, also, I, I'd like to point out that in many, many, many cases, readme is enough. So you shouldn't be kind of... Um, a well-written readme we, is enough. Yeah, well-written <laughs> readme is... Extensive readme is enough. But the point yeah. is that we shouldn't be kind of intimidated by the thought that the documentation needs to be a whole, whole uh, HTML documentation uh, web page but i think the simplest check is once you have read once you've done your stuff and you have your readme ask a colleague that's not in the project could you take this and reproduce the figures mm. and not help them while doing it yeah um one small thing try to avoid spaces in directories and file names yes it's uglier to read but um a lot of times there are computer uh, there are programs that don't handle spaces well. So ha not having spaces in there can make things a lot easier um, computational wise. It's not absolutely necessary, but it's, I would say, good practice. Um, if you need separate public and private uh, parts, you can create a public and a private Git repository. Uh, make sure that they are not in the same, uh, uh, same Git network. So, um, I would really create separate repositories for it and not fork from the one to the other and then make it private. Um, if you need to separate public and secret data um, in, in the same repository, you can use gitignore um, as was, I think, discussed last week. And having and setting up a gitignore early on always makes sense. Um, and yes, and the rest, I think, we already mentioned. No, so uh, about the project structure, mm -hmm. uh, does does your project always look like this structure? Does it often look like this? 
does it never look like this this example um it looks similar um i don't really have these parts at the moment anymore but um i do have yeah source code data potential documentation but as you mentioned um actually mainly readmes that hmm. sometimes point to another uh to a second md uh, markdown file uh, for a specific setup of development systems or something like that but yeah hmm. conceptually similar okay. it looks it looks very standard and it's yep. always nice to use standard practices yep so um sorry um yeah um the tracking uh, tracking your data uh, and your project is also important and um well all code should be version controlled and should be in the source code folder I have a license in there um you can also version control data files if they are not too large. If they are very large, you can still version control them uh, with systems like Git Annex or uh, Git L LFS. Um, large file. Large file system. Yeah. Uh, where you can essentially, uh, where the, the file is essentially placed somewhere else and it's just the, the version that's being tracked. Um, and Git Annex essentially builds an additional network of repositories where it knows where the data is residing. Um, and you can get the data, but uh, if you don't explicitly want it, you don't have to download it. Um, you can also, if they are sensitive or too large for the for being tracked, um, put in a Git put them into Git Ignore and provide them on a different system, which is perfectly fine, especially if it's research data that doesn't really change. So if you uh, if you have all your experimental data done and you're not going to get more experimental data, you can essentially put this into uh, in, uh, into, a Git, uh, into a folder, uh, put it onto some data server and yeah. And then just point to it in the README or somewhere else. Um, intermediate files don't ne really need to be tra need to be tracked. Um, commonly, there there might be situations where the pre-processing takes a long time, and you actually want to keep that data stored and potentially tracked as well. But in gen in general, I would say process data can be reproduced from re the original data or should be reproducible from the original data and therefore doesn't need to be tracked. Um, con well, using Git tags uh, to mark specific versions of results is always also a good idea um, uh, because you then know, okay, this is the version that was submitted for the thesis or for the paper, and people can uh, and you you can essentially in the paper point to this version because that's the data that was being used for the for the uh, for the for the paper, while your code could have developed on. Yeah. Um, so we have two more questions here that we can also put into the. Uh, are that are already in the um and they, yeah they are in the notes and and everybody is welcome to it's 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 mainly questions um about how how and well the first is mainly if you use version control for academic papers and the second is how you hand how if you do how you handle collaborative issues personally um I'm. I never used version control for manuscript writing, um, or rather, I never used Git for man for manuscript writing. Um, the main reason for that is that uh, color that um, writing collaboratively on Git is painful. There are mm -hmm. tools like Overleaf or uh, or Google Docs. Uh, where you can, or or HackMD, what you are just using, where everyone can write in the same document. 
And these uh, things can be used to easily create a academic paper. Um, and I personally prefer those tools because they they are especially suited for concurrent editing. While Git is Git can solve concurrent editing pro issues, but depending on how many changes there are and uh, and how much stuff two people did on a on an article, uh, you can easily end up with merging conflicts and it can become very painful. So, so personally, I yeah, I have used Overleaf, I have used Google Docs, um, and HackMD is also for first draft, and then you need to put it into a form for the for the journal in the end, anyways. So would you say that the Git Git is like a it's a very powerful version control tool, but yeah. in this case, it's a bit maybe too generic because um, the, because there are Git there is... are tools that are specifically specifically uh designed for for co-authoring papers or texts yes um what 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 i would say is that um git is very very good suited for code editing where um if you work on two different things but you have some modifications you then need to merge and then need to find out okay what uh, what happened and what and what changes uh, can be let go in and what change what how do we need to merge that where you anyways need to think about this mm -hmm. but if you uh, for example have two people who edited um a, a relatively final version of it of a mm -hmm. article and and made spelling or changed spelling mistakes and stuff. You will get you will get so many lines because GitHub essentially goes line by line where um you have change where you have changes in both on both sides that it gets really messy. Hmm. And you need to manually then select the right and you essentially do double the work if not more um when editing uh when ed when editing a, a a document, and um that's something that uh is unnecessary in my opinion, because there are tools like Overleaf or HackMD that, or or Google Docs, mm. which do exactly that and are exactly for this purpose, where you can work together on a on a document and don't get into these kind of issues. So I would use those instead we have uh, in, from the notes we have interesting uh, distribution between are you using version control for academic papers it's about 50 50 like yes yeah. and no um it is interesting yeah it, 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 i have used well i have used version control for academic papers no question whatsoever but mm. i haven't used it for writing the manuscript and i think that that's also like, oh, okay. It's a distinction there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. De 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 depends on uh, how people see this. Um, okay. Whether. Um, yeah. There, there, there is a comment um, on on the how to handle collaborative issues. Uh, one author being responsible for merging everything. Yeah, that author will. Uh, if they are lucky everything goes fine mm -hmm. if they are unlucky and you have concurrent edits uh, or a lot of concurrent edits they will spend a lot of time in merging them <laughs> and it's just yeah as a to to me writing the manuscript there is a waste of time mm -hmm. um having the code under version control and uh having and merging there yeah absolutely makes sense yeah okay but, um yeah um should we move on? Yes. Um, so there are other tools um, that help in making um, academic or scholarly output more reproducible. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks can be a good way to um, present the flow of your uh, uh, to essentially present the flow of your of your code more easily. Binder uh, gives 
Jupyter Notebooks and makes them available in an executable environment so that people don't even need to install the Jupyter stuff um, initially. Um, and for R, there's also R tools um, or Research Compendia, which are nice tools to uh, to use on uh, to use to show your results and show how your code is being used. Okay, so a key point here, an organized project directory structure helps with reproducibility and makes it a lot more easy to later on redo what you have done. So the next is essentially uh, is essentially then the question, okay, so you have your, your structure, your um, folder organized. How do we actually go about running our scripts? So you have some steps that need to be run to do your work and how do you actually run them? Does that rely on um, you remembering how you ran them um, or is it reproducible for anyone else? How do you communicate these steps uh, to others or um, in particular future you? And here we will also go into how we can create a reproducible workflow and when uh, what scientific workflow management systems are and when to use them. So as an example here, um, we have a uh, example project um, from the HPC Carpentry lessons, um, uh, which is essentially uh, which is essentially uh, a small project that um, counts your um, uh, uh, it's a small project that counts the the frequencies of words in a in uh, some books and then plots them. Hmm. Um, so the example use of this is. Um, let me just check something. So the example you use is uh, where you simply have Python code, code.count.py, uh, count and then plot the uh, the output file into uh, into an image. Um, and Tim, do you want to explain uh, what the problems with this kind of approach are? Uh, it is. So it's a very manual approach. And so if we want to, I would say that if we want to have multiple books, so let's say we have 100 or 1000 books, then, uh, then we would have to, uh, we do all of those manually and then there is no record of what books were processed. Uh, I think that's that's at least the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah, and um, we also, it's not really extendable. So if we have this, um, what do we do if we, if we want to run this for 500 books? We we could even have a small GUI or something, but then we would need to uh, need to click like five hundred times. And uh, so, and of course, you can essentially write a script that keep uh, that does run or essentially run everything, which would be something like this. This is now on Binder on the on Jupyter Hub. Um, oh, not on no, in the Jupyter Hub on Binder. And you, you could essentially run all of these and then you have your results, but that doesn't really um, help you when you have to extend that to 500 books. So this is more of an imperative style. Um, we tell it to do every single step in, every, in, in order and um, we can potentially also use something like um, like a loop for this where we just indicate the name, and then we uh, can still run it uh, for all of them. This is a bit better because we only mm -hmm. have to put in the name, but we are still explicitly telling it what to do. Um, um, 
yeah, and also the the loop looks much better, but there is one problem is that if we want to rerun something or we want to add some books and rerun the experiment, then all the all the books will be process it again. Yeah, and th that's really not what we want to do, especially if the stuff that we are running uh, takes a little bit longer. So if we are running something that takes half an hour for everything and we uh, suddenly have to rerun 500 um, iterations of this, yeah, we really don't want to do that. So um, this scripted solution is reproducible. That Yeah, definitely. But if we start to add more things, it starts to get problematic, as, as Timo mentioned. And that's actually the point where workflow tools come in. Workflow tools um, in more complex scenarios, so where it goes away from the simple, I have three things that I need to run and I don't have more than these th three things, but I, or where I get additional, re additional things after some time and I, I'm still producing my data, for example, and I need to do something for every data point. That's where workflow tools come in very handy. And we will give an example here with Snake Make, which is um, inspired by GNU Make and uh, is a very popular tool in, for, in bioinformatics, uh, but also in other uh, computational fields. Um, we also chose Snake Make because it's very close to Python. So um, in, in the Snake Make, files or snake files, you can write code in Python, essentially. And uh, we have we have a demo here um, in uh, in Binder that I will quick quickly, or we'll show you in, in a moment, but I would first like to go through the uh, way the that snake make actually writes your or that SnakeMake files are actually created and how SnakeMake works on a logical um, basis. So SnakeMake works with rules and rules have to be fulfilled for SnakeMake. So to, for a rule to be fulfilled, it needs to have all its inputs and then generates all its outputs by the command that's being uh, called in, in shell. And that's a bit unintuitive because um, commonly what happens is you define in your rule all the inputs which are the endpoints of what you want to create. And in here we have in rule or in, in our all rule, we have all we want to create all the files in statistics book data where the name of the book comes from this data uh, from the data field which is essentially all files all file names in the uh, data folder and we also want to create all the plots and this defines that okay uh, this defines our final results and then snake makes starts to look okay how do i get these is there any other rule that creates these? And it look, and looks on. So there is a rule count words, which has as inputs a script called counted pi and a book data file txt. And these files uh, come, uh, wait, and uh, the these file this is just a placeholder again, which comes from, uh, which in the end comes from data because it knows that, okay, this entry comes from here then. And then you uh, have the have a Python script that says, okay, well, from the inputs, I take the script and I take the book and I create the output. And if we look back up, this is exactly what we had so this this is the first step. Uh, that's what the rule, the the count rule essentially is doing. 
or the count words. And in the make plot, this is essentially the same um, uh, the same structure uh, and again as above. And um, I will show you this on. on yeah. Binder. So so uh, so how uh, so how the snake make works? The rule works is that each rule will take an take an input file and then it looks that if that input file doesn't exist on the disk it will find a rule that has that input file as the output file and then and that's why we start from the end yeah it's uh yeah so. and one thing i need to mention here um in our current uh in, in this binder the results are already there so we already have these final these final results and we also already have the uh have the statistics being processed so the first thing um i actually need to do is remove them because otherwise it doesn't do anything because it has has everything already so i delete all these files and if i then start to and as you can see on the left um the statistics stuff is now gone and if I then run this, what SnakeMake does is it essentially checks, okay, what do I have to do? I have to create or I have to uh, fulfill the all once. To do that, I have to count words four times and I have to make plots four times. So in total, I have nine things that I have to do. The four all times is once for each book. Yeah. The, the, the all is just a final check. So that's only... That that's pretty simple, but the other uh, the other code is something that needs to be changed. And there I have my data again. Now, the beauty of this is if I, for example, remove this last data and run it again, it will notice that okay, um, I'm missing one count words. Um, and since I'm missing that, I also have to redo the plot because, um, yeah, I don't know if this has to, uh, if the data that uh, is being uh, created um, will really lead to the same uh, the same picture or the same output here. So I'm rerunning this, and I have to execute the all again because, yeah, I'm missing something from there. And one more thing that I think is very important, and um, why we have these code pieces in our in uh, in our rule as inputs. If I change the count.py here and run this again, they, it doesn't know what was changed, but it, know, uh, but it knows, okay, the count has changed. Oops, this was too far up. The count has changed. So I need to rerun everything that depended on this input count.py. That creates me the data, the data in, or statistics data information, which my make plot depends on. So I have to rerun the make plot because I don't know if that has uh, has changed, and it will essentially run rerun everything that's necessary to keep in sync with all the inputs, and that's the real beauty of these things. So you you can you can go through it and you can um. Make sure that only the stuff is rerun that is necessary, but everything that is necessary is rerun. And that's really something that um, allows you to keep all your results in sync and allows you to um, run additional code uh, or additional um, additional inputs without rerunning everything. Um, it also has the has the possibility um, to uh, is it, uh, to get, to give you or to use containers or environments, um, and you can visualize the uh, the graph that is being created here as well. Yeah, okay, or not. Mm -hmm. At least not in this environment. Um, it was a good example of like <laughs> unreproducible. Yeah. 
<laughs> so we would need to install the uh the grant or well, we can we can probably just install it here as well. But I'm but that could take a bit of time. Yeah, that can take. Um so essentially what's happening is um for all I need to create the count words with the input of the file Sierra. Um this is also the input for the make plot and all needs to have make plot. And that's the same for all the other inputs. So the all depends on all of these individual things and only then all is fulfilled. The reason why using snake make and or why we're presenting snake make and not other tools um, I would say some people claim it has a relatively le gentle learning curve. Um, I think it depends a lot on your example uh, or on your uh, use case, whether it's gentle or not and how many features you actually need. Uh, if you don't need too many features from it, then yeah, it has a relatively gentle learning curve. If you need a lot of features, then well, like with any system, if you want to use all the features that it offers, uh, it has quite a bit of stuff that you need to learn. Um, I think for me, mainly, it's uh, it's free, it's open source, and it installs pretty easily via Conda or via PIP, and you can use it on both Windows uh, or on all Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. And, um, and that's also beauty. It is highly compatible with high-performance computing. Um, you can essentially tell SnakeMake that run these things on, on a cluster, run these things with um with the the HPC scheduler. So don't run them on the local machine but run them elsewhere and run them as individual jobs. Uh which lets you parallelize all of these parallelizable steps very easily. Um yeah it's uh as I mentioned earlier, it's possible to you define uh, software, isolate software environments in per rule. So essentially defining that we will now use uh, a certain Conda environment or even to use a certain container to run these things in. We'll come to containers later and what they are, how they work. And as we mentioned, it's heavily used in bioinformatics and it's a nice functionality to archive your workflow. Um, and to properly archive it. You could, for example, um, put in the uh, parameters that were, you were using in a SnakeMake file and then have everything that you were using in that SnakeMake file. And if you want to use a new parameter set, you could you, you could create a new SnakeMake file and keep the old one. Uh, or if, if the SnakeMake file is under version control, you can simply go back to that version so that helps a lot in also remembering what was being used in the past. Mm. Um, there are additional similar tools like Make, which is um, very heavily used in C compiling. Um, there's Nextflow, Task, and um, other tools that and, help and, in and about this. 200 others there yes. are a lot of workflow managers yeah and of course computational steps can be recorded in many ways um a script can be perfectly sufficient but make sure that when recording your computational steps you also record input parameters you also record what was uh, what input parameters what um stuff was used to run, to run the analysis. And in snake make, I would put it in this, in the snake file, um, in a bash script or uh, any other script, I would try to put it into the, into the file there as well, because otherwise you will forget it. I know uh, that I would. <laughs> yeah. There is a, in the notes, there is a question about, uh, parallelization. So how does snake make make the parallelization happen? Does it require the user to set some parameters? Um, the minus J, I think, uh, is the number mm -hmm. of jobs that you can run in parallel. Yes. So if you would um, 
run minus j20, it would try to run 20 things in parallel. So what snake make does it it detects from your rule rules that okay these rules can be run in parallel they don't depend on each other and then it checks the from the minus j parameter or the option the the number of workers that how many how many cpus do you have available and if you have more than one uh, CPU available, then it can start running the the rules in parallel. I think that's the that's the short of it. Yeah, and on clusters, there is integration with Snakemake and Slurm, um, but we won't go into this in detail at the moment. Um, I. If you think that you would benefit from um, using Snakemake, uh, I would highly recommend going through the documentation because what mm -hmm. we have given here is a very small example um, and a very simple example. And like always with simple examples, they look easy to do um, on the surface. And once you actually want to do that, uh, want to use them for you, you have to go back to the documentation. Um, this is mainly to show you this is something that's possible and that's available and how to find it. Yeah. Um, do uh, we are at the stage when we could have the break? Yep. And I would say we have a 10 minutes break till two past the hour. Yes. Okay. And keep, uh, keep posting your questions on the on the collaborative document, um, we can keep answering them or take your break uh, and have a have a small walk around so that mm. you can come back refreshed. Okay, okay then. Bye and see Bye. you in 10 minutes. Okay, and welcome back. So we've talked about organizing your folders, organizing your code and recording the recording the steps and the next thing that we want to talk about is recording dependencies and how to um, communicate different versions of software dependencies and well our code often depends on other codes uh, or other libraries and that in turn depends on other codes and so on so for reproducibility reasons we can version control our code with git but how can we version control dependencies? How we can we capture and communicate them? And um, connected with that is that we can easily end up in a somewhat of a dependency hell where different codes that need to be run for the same analysis uh, actually have conflicting dependencies. The one depends on a different version of a library than the other. And that starts to get really problematic. And there is this nice XKCD comic um, that shows very well how our modern computational infrastructure um, works and that it's a very complex pattern of libraries and libraries and libraries depending on other libraries. And this on top here, that might be your code. And it depends on a lot of different things down below, uh, down to operating systems kernels. And then it probably depends on some projects, some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003. And if that piece of code breaks, yeah, the whole thing tumbles down. And there is actually a very recent example that came out, that happened way after this um, this comic was created where um, it uh, there wasn't a breakdown as such, but there almost happened to be a very, very, very se uh, severe security issue because someone socially engineered themselves into the maintain into a maintainer position of one of these tiny bits of codes that uh, everything relies on and start and had managed to get some backdoors into the code. And that was almost shipped to the stable versions of some um, operating systems. 
that was the XZ library, um, which is essentially a compression library that is used in a lot of systems as an underlying library. So this picture is very accurate. And yet, unfortunately, it's very accurate. Hmm. So to make this whole uh, thing a bit more understandable, a bit more tangible, um, we can also think of a kitchen analogy to your to your code and your and what you're doing. And essentially, your software that you have that's the recipe. That's the recipe on how to get uh, how to process the data, which are the ingredients, to get your results. So that your dish. And to do that, you normally take uh, some libraries, which are pots or tools. And now it's very simple to imagine that, okay, you have a recipe for a huge amount of pasta because that recipe is supposed to feed 40 people. And your recipe says to take the te uh, take a 10 liter, uh, 10 or 15 liter pot of water. Well, that wouldn't work. That whole recipe wouldn't work if the only pot that you have is a one liter pot. So if you only have the one liter version of that library, so only the one liter pot, you can't, your recipe just doesn't work because you can't fill 10 kilos of uh, spaghetti into a one liter pot. Hmm. So that's how you can think about um, how software uh, data and libraries work together. And there are plenty of tools that uh, try to help you specify what uh, tools you actually need. And um, try to help you in specifying the specific library versions that are needed and handle all the dependencies that are underlying these libraries. Because you might be working with, for example, Pandas, but Pandas needs other libraries to work. And this kind of dependency tree is something that you don't want to care about yourself. And so um, defining, def having a tool that helps you there is very beneficial. And common tools that help there are Conda, Pip, virtual environments, um, poetry for um, for uh, package building, um, the requirement.txt, which lists the individual requirements, the environment.yaml, which is the equivalent to Conda and so on. And they try to help you in defining the specific set of dependencies, possibly with well-defined versions. They help you in installing those dependencies because they get the underlying dependencies. They help you with recording the versions for all these dependencies. And virtual env and anaconda for or anaconda for example also help you in isolating environments so that you can have multiple different uh, sets of environments on one computer so that if you have two pieces of code that have conflicting dependencies you can still run both of them you just need to change the environment for that they even help you with uh, changing the versions of R or Python per project or even within the same project if you have code that needs, if you have very old code that still needs um, Python 2, you can do that. If you have a code that needs an R version below 4, yeah, you can do that. So so some of these tools or approaches are uh, Python specific and some are more, uh, more general? Mm -hmm. uh... Yeah. So Conda, Anaconda, they are quite general. Yeah, while uh, virtual env is more a Python yeah. or PyEnv. Yeah, while exactly. rnv is more R and R, so on. Yeah. Um, and one really beautiful thing with, for example, Conda, uh, yeah, ma mainly Conda, mainly with actual or also Pine um, virtual and so with these whole, whole things is that 
if something goes wrong or you want to try something out and it didn't work, you can delete the environment and recreate it from the environment file. So you can test, okay, I have found a library that seems to be solving a problem that I have. Let's, let's add it to the environment, test it, uh, didn't work. Okay, before I try to remove that uh, library again, because um, there might have been other things that came along with it that I didn't properly record yet, I just throw out, uh, throw away the environment, recreate it because it will be the same as I had before. Hmm. And we have here um, five examples of uh, students that wrote code and um, which depends on a couple of libraries and they, the code was uploaded to GitHub. And let's assume we travel three years into the future and find the GitHub repositories and try to rerun the code before adapting it. Um, there are a couple of questions um, in the in the collaborative document now, which we would like to have your opinions, and I would give that like three minutes or so, or five minutes to read through it and answer that, and just say, okay, well, what do you think? Is this reproducible or isn't that reproducible? Okay, so see you in five minutes. And you can also, uh, if you have comments about it, um, write the comments there and what the issues are. So, Should we go? We start... we go? Yeah, I sorry. I think we will start discussing once we have a few comments um, mm. for a cert for one of them, and you can go through it and just listen to what we say about it. In general. Yeah. Looks like uh, A is starting to get some. Yeah. Um. I think A. We already have a clear tendency yeah consensus um that this is not reproducible and yeah absolutely um if you just have imports you might not even know which libraries are actually being used because sometimes there are two libraries that provide the same imports and um that essentially means that you can either load library a or library b and um or you can have a dependency on library a or library b but in the code they have the same import statement because you have mm. conflicting import. That's absolutely possible. So yeah, this is anything but reproducible. And also but, also not very nice if you think about the <laughs> workload you are yep. like, putting on the next person trying to figure or out. Or on yourself rerunning it. <laughs> yeah. Um, B, we also already have a quite clear thing that yeah, if, if you have a list of libraries that are used, that's at least helping. But if you ha don't have any versions, um, you sometimes have breaking changes in between versions and you don't necessarily know which version was being used. You, you, you mm -hmm. can try to guess what version was being used, but if this was being created somewhere in the transition between, let's say, major version 2 and major version 3 of the same library, mm -hmm. um, it's a whole lot of guesswork which version was actually used. Because very often um, published code is already older. So it was essentially developed a year ago or so. And um, the version that was used back then was being used. And yeah, we, we just don't know. Yeah, for example, so this function uses, or this, this class uses a function that was introduced in version two, but was deprecated in version four. So it, or say deprecated in yep. version six. So it must be somewhere between uh, two, three, four, five, and then the subversions. And it's, again, it's not very nice thing to do for to yourself or to the next person trying yep. to figure out your code. 
and see um again yeah as people mentioned here the, it's nice that you have an environment file that already helps quite a bit but mm -hmm. um there is of course still missing version numbers so you don't know which versions were actually being used is this now python 3 or python 2 um <laughs> So, and what this file is supposed to tell you. Okay, Th that's actually a good question here. So, it uh, the environment YAML file is a file for um, Conda. Conda is, um, is a dependency management system that um, reads through this and says, okay, well, I'll create an environment with the, uh, with the following name. And then um, I'm using these channels, I'm using these sources. And in this case, it's ConduForge. ConduForge is a pretty popular repository uh, for, for packages. And the dependencies are then listed as SciPy. So, so the SciPy package, NumPy, SymPy, Click, Python, Pip. And Conda also allows you to do installs with Pip because not every package is actually in Conda. And it allows you to create an environment that has pip uh, installations. And here, this indicates that, okay, this is git, uh, this is a pip installation from this git repository at the master at the master branch. Um, and actually, that's a problem in itself because master can have changed. There is no idea, uh, there is no information on what master is nowadays. This can mm -hmm. be completely different. So, and very likely is because the yeah. the latest master. Brand well, yeah, will... mo most likely. As assume, yeah, assuming that this is from other users that actually still develop their uh, their yeah. code. Uh, for D, we and the uh, and the version versions are okay. So yeah. how you fix that could be like in the uh, in the notes in version D. But you essentially have a yeah. specific uh, git commit um, or a specific tag that um, this project is being used at. Um, there is um, the comment in the uh, that there are missing uh, that there might be different builds. That's true. Um, there is one problem with the, with builds. Builds can be operating system specific. So um, for Absolute reproducibility, yes, you need the build. Um, but commonly, the version is sufficient. The version is sufficient to uh, hopefully get the same results. If you really need to go down to the build number, it's very likely that something um, fishy is happening. And I wouldn't uh, wouldn't rely on my, um, on my results too much, actually. Uh, but yes, for complete reproducibility, um, the build should be in there. Um, for usability, I wouldn't put it in, to phrase like that. And um, I come to that. Uh, I come to that a bit later, actually. Um, that uh, in the next demo, where we show the differences here. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else? Um, yeah, the, this has the adva the, the E has the advantage over D that um, these projects that were referenced here have now been put onto Conda. But um, actually, if if that is, you can be happy. If that isn't. Well, that's also something that's very common that you need some pip packages uh, or that you need something from a, a different Git repository. And of course, there is the problem that these Git repos repositories could have been deleted. But if you want to make sure that um, you, you keep those Git repositories and you need a specific version from a specific Git repository, fork it and use your own fork because you are in control of your own fork, and as long as you don't delete that fork, that stays. So this way is perfectly fine if you make sure that the repositories don't disappear. Mm. Uh, okay, and that's essentially also what's listed in the solution. Um, 
Yes, are if there, you, yeah. Uh, so what about paid packages and Conda packages? Do they not disappear ever? Uh, they can. Um, hopefully not. But even Conda packages can disappear, especially in uh, very fast moving fields. Hmm. Where or where um or if you use let's say more unstable channels, more developmental channels, um mm. I I've seen uh some PyTorch versions no no longer being supplied by some of the providers uh because they are too old and considered as not useful anymore. But that's of course a real problem for reproducibility. Yeah. So so in general, if you use uh like well known and widely used channels and packages from Conda or Pip, it is very unlikely that they will disappear. But yeah, they, they can. Um, and yeah. how to solve that problem? We can come to, well, how to, no, how, how, how to switch that problem to a different, a different level, um, we come to in a, uh, we'll come to in a bit. Yeah. So now, um, we will demo creating our own small time capsule for a um environment and for the future world and um yeah they, this is essentially um I have created this environment at YAML and as uh, as explained above this is, I can quickly um show that this is essentially what's written in here so conceptually as again it wants to create an environment called my n with the channel with the channels um conda forge and in this case default with uh, defaults which is the anaconda environment um one mention here this can become a bit problematic uh because anaconda recently changed their um uh, changed their policies for uh, even that even academic institutions now have to pay if they have over a certain amount of users and um it might be good not to use defaults here um conda forge normally has all the packages that you need and even has more packages than default uh, than the anaconda environment but the anaconda environment is a bit better curated Okay, um, that, and then it is the dependency. So this would be something that depends on Python 3.10. Um, uses uh, also wants to have NumPy, pandas, and Seaborn. And yes, it doesn't give any. Um, it doesn't give any. Uh, any version, version numbers here at the moment. So um, I will be using Mamba instead of Conda, uh, and the reason is that otherwise um, Conda can take quite a bit of time to actually create environments and I want to spare us all the time. Mamba is a drop-in replacement uh, that's just faster because it uses C while Conda is uh, programmed entirely in Python. Okay, so this will essentially create this environment, check the sources that I, in that I indicated and start to then download the files or it should so it checks for these and i should them have them already downloaded so there's no oh. Oh, it actually fi found something that probably has a newer version and it wants to take the newer version. So that that's something which is actually quite nice to see. So mm -hmm. if I had created that a little bit earlier, it would be slightly different now yeah. because this is a different version. So, and if I then say conda activate um, my env, I have my environment where in Python I can import Seaborn and have my Seaborn library and so on. So um, I can now also export this environment. And that's essentially um, 
what was mentioned earlier in the notes that this lists everything, including the build number, the build ID. And if you look, uh, if you look into this a bit, um, you will notice things like this one, where well, libplus is Linux 64. So yeah, I'm on a Linux system, uh, and this is a build that's specific for Linux. So if I would provide this de this dependency file, anyone who is on a Windows system will have problems installing this environment because this is not available for Windows. That's why this kind of um, system where you have all the individual um, build numbers might not be the best thing. It's good to have, um, and I would put it in as for reproducibility so that people can actually see what were, what exact builds were being used. But for usability of your code, so if someone wants to use that library in a different project, this is questionable. There's the other option, which is very convenient. Um, you can say from history. And if I check into that, this is exactly what I installed. This lists exactly, um, even if I later on would install uh, something with Mamba install, whatever, um, it would list exactly the right packages here. Um, there is a third option. Which is called no builds. And that is the same as the environment file, but without the builds. That can be also be useful if you want to make a clear specifications which underlying packages were being used without providing builds. But it still has the problem that there are things like the LD implementation in Linux. So yeah, that might still not work on a Windows system. So. Uh... So what is uh what is the recommendation here? What, Can you uh, what I personally them? would recommend uh for a project um to provide is the export from history. Mm -hmm. So this and for reproducibility reasons I would put in the complete export. Mm -hmm. Because that shows uh, th then if if someone has the same operating system and so on. This should be really exactly the same uh, the same environment that they get when creating that. Yeah. While the from history will create an environment that is um, as close to what kind of I would recreate if I would start this now. Um, and and is the one that solves on all operating systems, so is more general. But at the same time, we have to admit that this is not a good initial environment file. Your initial environment file should have the NumPy version, should have the Pandas version, should have mm -hmm. the Seaborn version that you want to use. Okay. So yeah. So this, so to yeah. So to summarize summarize because this is this uh. So in your in your initial environment file, do have the version numbers. But then, for completeness, it is okay to also uh, to include in your uh, in your repo the 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 complete export with the yeah. with the builds. I I would even recommend it as a as an additional um inform piece of information. Yeah, because it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um we unfortunately don't have really time to go into details with R. Uh but um essentially you can use uh Conda with R as well. Conda does have R um th does support R mm -hmm. and I have created several environments with Con OS um for R with uh, using Conda. Hmm. Um so the so, but 
since since we saw that um, an underlying library, a system library, can cause problems, um, and up until now we mainly considered non-system libraries, even though Conda already does some system library stuff. Uh, let's go to recording the environment. And I think everyone has heard the, well, it works on my machine um, comment from someone at some point. And uh, this meme sums up the idea behind Docker or other uh, containerization systems quite well. That when, well, it works on my machine, well, then we'll ship your machine. And yeah, that is how Docker was born, essentially. So we want to ship something or give something that um, provides as much as possible of the operating system to the others, uh, to the user in the end. And to go back to our kitchen analogy, so as we said, our code scripts are the cooking recipes. And then in, with containers, you have container definition files, and they are like a blueprint uh, to build a kitchen with all the utensils uh, and stuff that the recipe needs to be prepared. The next thing is we have the container images, and those are kind of showroom kitchens based on these container uh, based on the blueprints that we have created before. And a, and a showroom kitchen is not connected, so there there are electricity is not plugged in, water is not plugged in. Uh, you can't really use it. And a container is then essentially this showroom kitchen connected to everything. And in addition, there's a protective layer being put on everything so that you can work with it. And in the end, you re kind of remove this protective layer so that you still have the, uh, that you still have the um, original uh, container kind of. So, um, as we said, containers can be built to bundle all the necessary ingredients, data, code, environment, operating system, even though data, uh, even though including data might be problematic, depends mm -hmm. on your, um, depending on your system. Um, a container image is somewhat like, yeah, also like a piece of paper with all the operating system on it. And when you run it, you put a transparent sheet on it to form the con uh, to form essentially the container. Then that container runs, and you write on that transparent sheet and uh, do all the changes on this transparent sheet. And when you're done, you tear off that transparency sheet, and you still have your original container, and everything that was done on this transparent sheet is gone. And the definition files are essentially text files that contain a series of instructions on how to build these container images. So, so to so to recap here, it's uh, we have three concepts, and first, kind of like a starting point would be the definition file. Let's say a Docker file or a similarity definition file, and we use that definition file to create an image a container image or image for short and that image and that definition file of course they are persistent but then when we create a container out of that image then that container is not persistent so the container is what is actually being run and when that container is stopped it stops running, then it vanishes. But the image is still there on the disk. Then everything that was changed in the container vanishes, yes. Okay. Yeah, and why would why would you want to use these? Um, there are two main reasons. Um, one is installing a certain software is tricky or not supported um, on the system that you're using. Um, that's very common on HPC systems. HPC systems uh, in general have a very, very minimalistic operating system with as little um, uh, with as little uh, 
software installed as possible as to leave as much computational and memory available to um, for a user to exploit and use. But that means that a lot of small libraries that code depends on are not there. So what you can do with a container, you can you can essentially put all the stuff in that container and run it via that con uh, run your code via that container. Um, the other option is that you want to uh, make sure that whoever is using the code uses it in the same kind of environment or same environment as you. And then you can provide them an image for of your container uh, because then you essentially have provided the whole environment. Um, they, there might be a problem if, you, if people are using different architectures than you. Um, and there might be a problem if people are using a different operating system than you use. There are, well, um, for, Lin for uh, uh, you, you can run Linux um, uh, containers on Windows. That works reasonably well because Windows has a, su a Windows subsystem for Linux, but you can't really run Windows containers on Linux, hmm. unfortunately. So one way it works, the other unfortunately doesn't. Yeah, so the the shipping the machine is a bit of a exaggeration. Yeah, okay. So um, um let let's have a look at one of these uh, container recipes. They come uh, this is a singularity definition file and um there's a link to the reference if you want to look into it in more detail. And singularity commonly um starts with and information on where this is coming from, and if it's um, and Singularity can use Docker images um, to base your new images on, and if it says uh, and Bootstrap essentially indicates okay, this is where it's coming from. So this comes from the Docker repository, and from is the statement on what is the original image that we are using as a base for what we are doing here. And that's commonly some operating system or some programming language that you're using where essentially all the all the packages that you need for that base operating system or base programming language are already installed. And then you can start to do more things on it. And post is then essentially what happens after these uh, after that basic installation. So what changes do we need to do to our system to uh, make it do what we want want the container to do? And at least on any Linux um, or on any Ubuntu, this commonly starts with apt-get, why update? So just get the latest um, updates, which can in itself be a bit of a problem if you want to redo that. And then install the packages that we need. Um, you can set some environment variables. You can potentially also copy over files and so on. And then you have a run script, which is the final command that is being run uh, when this container is being run. So this container would run date, pipe to cause, pipe to lockhead. That's what this container would be doing. It's not very useful, but it's just an example. Hmm. Um, yes. And yeah, and so. So does does every image that we build do they all like run a script or no? You don't necessarily need to run a script. Um, you can also have a container that uh, essentially doesn't do anything and just provides an environment, or mm. the way you and need then, to tell it. Okay, what can... do you want to execute in the container? Okay. So so then it's kind of like a generic platform to yes. run whatever script you want in that specific yes. environment. Okay. And there are a couple of different um, uh, container platforms. There's Docker and Podman, which is more of a, which are, I would say more of single user, uh, in particular Docker is more of a single uh, or a container system for a single use, uh, user system, because Docker has the disadvantage that uh, it essentially needs to have um, administrative or pseudo uh, rights um, and it will run all the or 
it will run essentially as a super user. So it can do everything on your system. Singularity and Aptainer um, are pretty popular on high performance computing systems because they essentially get rid of this requirement of running it as a super user. Um, and you can run and you can still run the these containers. Hmm. Um, Potman is very close to Docker. Um, and yeah, it's what, what's the default container engine on Red Hat systems, for example. Okay. So if you have a single machine or what, like a single, to, single if, user or if you have a single user. machine, yeah. If you have a single machine, um, you can, and no super user rights, you can use Singularity Obtainer Portman. If you have super user rights, you can use Docker. If you don't have super user rights, you can't use Docker. It's pretty simple. Someone can, yeah. add, someone so can add you to the, someone can add you to the Docker users, uh, but that would essentially give you super user rights. Yeah. So um, they can as well just give you administrative rights then. Um, so pros and cons of containers. Um, well, they allow you to move workflows across different platforms with the um, constraints that we mentioned earlier. Um, they can solve. They can definitely solve the works on my machine situation because you essentially ship the um, the operating system or the underlying libraries. Um, for software with many dependencies. Um, they can offer the only way to preserve the computational environment for future reproducibility. What we had uh, previously where this Conda environment had things, now we can create this image and we can actually ship this image because that image, regardless on whether the, whether the repositories are no longer in the, uh, or the repositories no longer have these versions, they are in the image. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the image is created, they are in the image. So for reproducibility, you need the image. You don't necessarily need the definition file, but that is very, very useful to reproduce the image. Um, but if you want to have it reproducible, you need to provide that image. Um, it's also a mechanism to send the computer to the data uh, when your data set is either too large to transfer or if when your data set is in a secure environment and you just can't uh, you don't have an internet access, so you can't just install um, Conda packages or whatever, but you can give the image file to the system administrator and they will put that image file onto that, compu onto that computer and then you can run the tools that your image provides. Mm -hmm. um, it's a further set of um, separation where you can install software into a file, so that image file instead of onto your computer separating again, or essentially meaning that you don't have to change your computer setup to install something. There are, of course, also some drawbacks um, because uh, containers can be used to hide away software installation problems and which should normally have been solved by better development practices. So yeah, it's too difficult to install. Um, yeah, we don't make the installation easier, which would be the right uh, thing to do. We'll just provide a Docker image so that people can use it. Yeah. Um, you can run into the, instead of works on my machine, works only in this container, which again leads to the same question. Why does it only work in this container? What's mm -hmm. in this container that um, makes it possible? And if that is, yeah a specific version of a normally available software, then yeah, there might be problems with what you have actually. Um, they can and are difficult and are somewhat difficult to modify. And depending on what you package in there, um, they can become very large. So um, every bit of data that you would put into a container, and that's why I said, um, shipping the data in the, or putting data into a container is a questionable thing that will make that uh, that container larger. For example, if you have large language models, you don't really want to put those large language models into a container because you will just increase the container size a lot. And if you use that model in multiple different containers, um, imagine a 40, 40 gigabyte model, uh, and now all your containers are 40 gigabyte in size. Um, 
instead, what you can do is you can have that image elsewhere, or no, ha have the um, model elsewhere and load it into the container when it's run. That makes it a bit less reproducible because you're not shipping the data, but it but overall it's I would say the better choice. Yeah. Um, so then then we are assuming that that hopefully the the language model will be will be distributed in some other centralized place, for example hugging face or something. Yes. So um there are different places where you uh, where containers can uh, can be found. Um, Docker Hub is very uh, popular. Quai is also quite popular. Uh, GitHub and GitLab uh, container registries can also be used, or, or even Zenodo. So, uh, so there was this uh, warning uh, about only use official and trusted yeah. images. So, what uh, what is what is your definition for an official and trusted image? Um, to me, it's the same as any other software that I uh, that I use from the internet. Um, if if I if I want to use a container, um, it should be coming from the essentially creators of the software that I want to use, mm -hmm. um, not from some third party whatever that provides me um, WinZip or whatever. Yeah. Um, where um, yeah, if I want to, if, or if I want to have Putty, I'm going to the Putty web page and download it from the Putty web page and not from some third party. Where yeah. I don't know if this is actually Putty or just a, tro a Trojan that's trying to, that's uh, that I've been installing on my system. Yeah. So, um, so if I want to use an image of Ubuntu, then I will use an yep. image provided by the what is it, the Linux Foundation yeah. um, or whoever is yeah. responsible for Ubuntu development. And similar to what we had uh, earlier with the environment, or with the environments, um, or the dependencies, we also here now have a um, Docker file, and uh, I want to quickly go through the Docker file to see what is actually um, how the Docker file can be reproduced, or if there are problems with this Docker file for reproducibility. Um, one mention right in right at the beginning. If you really want to uh, want it to be reproducible, provide the image, not just the Docker file, because only the image is what you actually used, and the Docker file is only the way how this image should be generated. But we'll mention why this is a bit problematic. Mm -hmm. So we have the or the singularity file here. So again, we have a singularity that uh, depends on Docker, and it starts from Ubuntu latest. Is that a good idea, Timo? Yeah, that's immediately a problem that the Ubuntu latest is dependent on when you are building the building the image. Yeah, three years ago this was Ubuntu twenty one oh something. Uh, nowadays it's twenty four or something. So yeah, it, it's building on a completely not completely, but a different operating system. So this is would definitely not be the same mm -hmm. if I run this now than three years ago. Then we start with our posts, so with our installations. Um, we export an environment for the, or an environment variable for the um, installation and uh, time. We upget update, as we mentioned before. We um, upget install with uh, a couple of libraries. And this already, th this is where this problem also comes back in. These libraries can have changed. Uh, even if we have a fixed version, these can change depending on whether the default libraries um, have changed over time. Hmm. Um, then this is some cleanup, which is fine. We create a virtual environment. We uh, upgrade pip. And well, we install some requirements.txt. That of course depends now a lot on the requirements.txt, um, how well defined the, the versions are in there. But if they are not well defined, we again can run into easy problems. Um, this file also, uh, the, this singularity file also has an additional um, section with files, which indicates what files are copied over into the into the con, uh, image. So it copies over the requirements.txt, and I would assume that this requirements.txt is in the same repository as this file. Hmm. The same with the app.py. So those files we probably have. 
and then it copies something from home myself data into app data. Yeah, um, home myself is not something that we have. So um, this is stuff that is probably not even in the repository. Um, so we don't know what that is. In that case, it's it's probably the data that is to be used by the app, and um, we said that we want to reuse it with our our data, so we can probably replace it with our data here. But yeah, that's not very helpful. And this is then a real problem because this has some fancy lip where we have no idea what that is, and yeah, puts it into uh, the libraries of the of this container. So mm. this is this makes the whole um, container definitely not, or the whole image not reproducible, yeah. or not so, reu even not reusable, not only not reproducible. Yeah. So to to um to recap the file section here. So I think I read the instructions again, and yeah, it doesn't say that it the uh, this this singularity file is definition file is is in a repo but yeah we are assuming that it's in a in a git repo and there is in the git repo with this definition file there is the uh, application code which is the app slash uh, no app.py app and that we have a requirements text file there in that git repo but like we talked earlier then data is not usually in the git repo especially if it's big data and so so the first requirements uh line and the app line are fine uh the copy data line is is quite iffy and the last line highlighted now with the fancy lip is like a definite no no. Yeah. 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 But so th these are the problems that you have with Docker definition files. And uh, which means that essentially, if you want to have your Docker file reproduce or your code reproducible by providing Docker, provide the image. Yes, it will be potentially big, but. It's the only way how you can actually have the environment that you used saved, and and not to not to confuse people any more than necessary. This is a singularity definition file. Right. Yes, sorry, not not Docker definition file. So, um, key points here is containers can be helpful if complex setups are needed to uh, running a specific software, and they can also be helpful for prototyping with messing up without messing up your own computing environment or to run software that requires a different operating system than your own, it depends a bit. Okay, so we are coming towards the end and the question is where to go from here and what to take away from this. So I think for me, um, we have shown you workflow tools and how and where to use it. And we have hopefully given you an idea where they will make sense in the future. In many cases, these workflow tools are probably not needed and a proper script with all the information is sufficient, but you probably want to consider using them when you are processing many files with many steps, if your steps or files may change, if you're still collecting your input data, or if your main script connecting your steps starts to get very long, um, because then it starts to get unreadable essentially and you you start to want to make different parts of it containers seem amazing but do i have actual use for them well maybe not but knowing that you can use them is already pretty useful that you can run linux tools on your windows computer you can run different versions of the same software on your computer that you can follow the easy installation instructions for an operating system that is not your own that you get a fully configured environment instead of installing just a tool and that you can share your setup and configurations mm -hmm. with others. So yeah, they can be very beneficial, but as with um, workflow tools as well, you will need some additional um, read up on how to use them. This was mainly to present that they are an option. 
And what we think is important for every project that you create, have a clear structure for your project, have a clear file structure, clear directory, so that you find things again. Record your workflow and write it down in a script file or if it's complex enough with a workflow manager. Create a dependency list and keep it updated, optimally in an environment file, um, because that makes reinstallations a lot easier and makes it a lot easier for others to follow what you have done. So software and, packages and their versions. Yes. And consider the possibility that someone, maybe you may want to reproduce your work. And can you do something small to make it easier? Write down some more instructions or similar things. If you have ideas, what you can do in the future, but no time, you can add an issue to the repository that you're creating your code on. And maybe someone else can help or you in a few years time notice, oh, well, I had this idea back then. Maybe I, maybe now I have a bit of time. I can write, I can actually implement that. Yeah. So, as as I have mentioned a few times, not everything in this lesson uh, might be useful right now, but it's good to know that these things exist. If you ever get into the situation where you would require such a solution, and you can come either back to these documentation uh, documents, or you can go to the course uh, to the respective um, documentation of the individual software to see, okay, how do I actually use them? And caring about reproducibility makes it work easier for the next person um, that's working on the project. And as likely as not, that will be you. So that's, I think, it for us. Demo, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, uh, good, good recap there. Um, okay, um... then. I would thank you and... Excellent. So I think we all thank you. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Demo, and thank you, Thomas. And um I don't think there's anything to lift. We still have four minutes. Should there should we consider some of the questions in the notes, but otherwise uh, I, I'm looking at the notes and uh, there is a comment about the future viewpoint is really important and I agree that I I don't think it can be emphasized like too much that it is mo most probably the person looking at your code later is you yourself or your experiment setup and all these things that we have discussed they may seem at first that, okay, this is, again, new learning curves. Uh, they will take time to get into, but they will save you time and energy in the end. And also they help the scientific community at large because you are making things more reproducible. Yes, so... We still have a couple of minutes, but of course we can also end it here if there's nothing to add. I just remind you that now we will have one hour lunch break. And after that, we will talk about social coding. It will be me and Hossein talking about uh, basically the social aspects of coding with other people, sharing repositories. And that comes, of course, with some kind of legal requirements. And so we will talk about licenses for code and software. All this in about uh, one hour. So I thank you, Thomas and Demo, for the great discussions. And I thank everyone for the comments on the notes. You can keep on writing comments and answers. And so we see each other in one hour. <clears throat> thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.